I'm shocked. Welcome back, Crackle Addicts. I'm Lupine Fiasco. This is Daily Fab Gameplay, and today we are playing Aurora Shooting Star. For anyone who is new to the channel, what we do here is review replays of games I played on the Talishar.net client days or weeks ago. After enough time has passed that I lose my bias and can more objectively judge the quality of my games. I will talk through turn cycles as if I were taking them now, explaining my thought processes for the lines I would take, and compare that to the lines I did take. We either learn from my mistakes or reinforce good play patterns with the overall goal of tightening and optimizing our gameplay in the future, taking down paper events, and walking away with that shiny, shiny cardboard. If you would like to check out the deck I'm playing here, or try it for yourself on Talishar, there is a Favory deck link in the video description below. While you're down there, if you haven't already done so, please consider subscribing to my channel. It is the best free way to support me, and to make sure that you see Daily Fab gameplay in your video feed five days a week. If you'd like to engage further, there is a link to my Twitter, to my Discord, and to my Patreon. Without further ado, let's jump right into the action. We're moving on from games recorded on October the 4th, on October the 6th. It's a new day, these are better games, we're not going to make the same mistakes that we made against Aurora or Zen, and we're going to win this game. It's going to be pretty good, but we still have some things to talk about as far as the value that Aurora is capable of producing versus the value that she might be capable of producing if we take a slightly suboptimal line, and you'll see what I mean. Specifically, it has to do with Channel Lightning Valley. We have won the die roll. We have chosen to go second. Uh, the first thing we want to note about this hand is we cannot make Embodiment of Lightning unless Aurora attacks us. So what we could potentially do is block with any of our attacks. We can then play Lightning Press, targeting the defending attack. That will count as having played a Lightning card this turn, and we can pitch our two extra cards to make an Embodiment of Lightning. Um, that would involve leaking damage. At this point, if Aurora is going to push with Spectral Shield and Rage Spectre, I'm no longer interested in making that play. I don't want to take five just to set up an Embodiment. I would rather block instead. So what I'd like to do is block with Lightning Surge and then hold on to Second Strike if I can. Uh, if Enigma is going to attack with Rage Spectre, then that block doesn't matter. We're going to block with our other two attacks anyway. But say Enigma just wanted to send the Spectral Shield and pass for some reason. Uh, second Strike is better to hold in hand because we... Uh, would have an easier time dealing damage to give it go again than we would um, putting Lightning Surge into our arsenal or using Snapdragons for Arcanic Shockwave. But regardless, none of that matters. We draw into three new cards. We've got kind of a clunker here. Um, it is a playable hand. We can pitch our blue to Starfall. We can play Electrostatic Discharge to give it plus one and go again. Then play Flittering Charge for seven. We're even holding the Lightning Press, not that we can use the go again, but if Aurora hard commits to blocking the Flittering and the Starfall and we want to make sure to clear this Rage Spectre, we do have Lightning Press as a combat trick. Um, as far as our other two resources, we can decide if we want to make an Embodiment or a Rune Chant. I think we should be making a Rune Chant here just because I really want to make sure this Rage Spectre dies. I would like to make sure that I'm not getting hit for another 6 on Enigma's turn. So I think that pitching 2 into Grasp rather than banking an Embodiment is fine. You could really go either way on this. Um, we have to... I suppose we could have sequenced this slightly differently. We could have pitched into Grasp to make a Rune Chant, then attacked with Flittering Charge, and used Lightning Press to give it plus three and go again, then use our remaining resource to attack with Starfall for two, and Arsenal Electrostatic Discharge. Discharge is probably a better card to keep in the Arsenal, honestly. It plays much better with Gone in a Flash, 
and with Starfall on future turns. So that is something to think about, actually. If I was redoing this turn, uh, I would have swapped the two, swapped the play line, and then ended up with an Electrostatic Discharge and Arsenal rather than a Lightning Press. And we can even see on our next turn, you know, maybe that would have made a difference in sequencing or power. Not that Press is a bad card to have in our Arsenal, it's fine, but um, Electrostatic Discharge works a lot better with Gone in a Flash, for example. Uh, we've got Enigma, Transcending, She Will, Make a Spectral Shield, uh, Levels of Enlightenment, likely coming in for three with Go Again and drawing a card. Our hand is kind of awkward. It isn't super playable without using Snapdragons. We can play Sizzle. We can pitch a red to attack with Starfall. We can then attack for four and use the Lightning Press. So this hand is playable on three cards. It's even playable on two. If we block with our Lightning Surge and our Gonman Flash, worst case, we play Sizzle, pitch Somersault to attack with Starfall. Um, what we can also do is, you know, play Sizzle, play Lightning Surge, uh, Lightning Press it. I think we do actually need to keep four cards, unfortunately. It's a little awkward, but I would love to get this Lightning Surge into my arsenal. Um, what we could also do is block with Gauntman Flash and Sizzle, play Lightning Surge, Lightning Press it, deal seven, somersault the Lightning Surge back into hand, and then arsenal it. Um, so this hand is pretty playable on four cards, and it's pretty playable on two. On three cards, I'm a little iffier on it. Uh, if we block with the Gone in a Flash, then we sizzle, Lightning Surge, press, somersault, deal 10, arsenal surge. So I guess that's fine too. Um, we're flexible. We can do really anything with uh, two, three, or four cards. We just want to make sure that we don't go down to just Somersault. If we were on just Somersault, then our hand is pretty unplayable. We're not going to block this uh, Levels of Enlightenment. We're also not going to block the Spectral Shield. Uh, Enigma has two resources floating. I haven't seen Count Your Blessings yet, but I also don't know that they are on Count Your Blessings. If this is a Command and Conquer, then I want to make sure that I can block it. We can use our Crown of Providence to save the Lightning Surge, but what we have to ask ourselves is what card fixes our hand? Uh, what makes this hand better? If we don't have the Lightning Press in Arsenal, uh, these four cards are like play Sizzle, pitch Somersault to Starfall for five, play Gone in a Flash, Arsenal Lightning Surge. It's a three card nine that puts a surge in the arsenal and like isn't embarrassing, but also kind of isn't the best thing that we could be doing. What I like doing is protecting this press and arsenal, not because we need it, but because I would rather have it. I don't want to take six from Command and Conquer. Uh, so if we block with Gone and Flash and Lightning Surge, we can use our Somersault defensively to get the two of them back. Uh, at that point, we're blocking five, so the question is, how are we covering the other point of damage? Are we using Grasp of the Arc Knight, or are we using Sizzle? And honestly, I prefer to use Sizzle here. I would like to save my equipment as much as possible. Yes, Sizzle is worth an extra point of damage on defense. Uh, sorry, on offense compared to defense. But the fact that the equipment sits on board is really impactful and more impactful I think than just a random two block head jab in our hand. Um, I do decide to block with grasp rather than sizzle. I think it's fine. Probably is not a huge difference. Um, just that I don't terribly value sizzle that much in this hand. Um, what we're going to end up doing here is just playing sizzle, playing gone in a flash, Lightning pressing it up to 10, and then arsenaling the Lightning Surge. On our next turn, we'll have a 5-card hand with Lightning Surge and Arsenal, and Tunic will be up. So at a minimum, we can get a 1-card 6 with Surge, Tunic, Starfall, and then see what the other 4 cards 
uh, in our hand do. At this point, we're expecting that Enigma is going to play a defense reaction from hand, but we also don't want to just pass priority to her. Say that she doesn't for whatever reason, uh, and she just couldn't use a ripple away and wanted to prevent some damage. Um, if that surge gets stuck in our arsenal, that's pretty terrible for us. We want to get that out. So yes, while we are in theory going to hit Enigma, um, we want to make sure that we are playing out that press. Noting too, I didn't talk about it at all, but had that been a discharge, um, a Snapdragon play would have been uh, really interesting to think about. Um, play Sizzle, play Gone in a Flash for seven, snap it, deal seven, play Discharge, pick up Gone in a Flash, play Gone in a Flash for another seven. Uh, so Surge there actually only worth three compared to Discharge that would have been worth seven. It would have cost our snaps to do it, but that would have been a really great time to use Snapdragons. So just another reason why that flittering line actually was pretty suboptimal. We have a Surge in Arsenal. Our Tunic is going to be up, and we're going to play a Channel Lightning Valley. So this is a pretty good hand. Um, do we want to use Tunic for Starfall compared to pitching Channel Lightning Valley? We do. I really don't ever want to put two Channel Lightning Valleys down in the same turn if I can avoid it, because paying for both of them is very difficult. I would rather have a single Channel Lightning Valley effect for uh, three or four turns compared to a double Channel Lightning Valley effect for two, especially when we have to play them from hand on the first turn. This hand only has three cards in it, effectively, trying to deal damage to Enigma, and I don't want to play Arc Lightning right now. So the potential for drawing two Channel Lightning Valleys is actually very, uh, drawing off the two is actually very low. So I want to play one, I'll pitch the other one, probably to make an embodiment, which means that I can use Tunic for Starfall. So what this turn looks like is Surge from Arsenal, Tunic for Starfall, um, at some point in there play Channel Lightning Valley so I can draw, pitch the second Channel Lightning Valley into Aurora to make an embodiment of Lightning, play Arcanic Shockwave, fusing it with Arc Lightning, and then hopefully playing whatever card any of that drew. And then I will bottom the second Channel Lightning Valley in pitch to keep the first Channel Lightning Valley on the arena. Which is all to say we're not going to block, um, certainly not Spectral Shield for two. If Enigma plays another Command and Conquer, we don't really have the ability to protect an arsenal, so we will crown it away. Even without an arsenal, this hand is very playable. Um, and a random fifth card off the top of our deck is pretty good too. So we will just take two here and hold off on potential blocks until we know what's coming. It is a Waxing Spectre. We can afford to take four here. We are pretty locked in at this point. We're not going to block with Arc Lightning. And the potential for damage and card draw goes way down without the Shockwave. But what is unfortunate about this is that... Um, Lightning Surge is no longer guaranteed to hit, and Starfall is no longer guaranteed to hit. So we can just play the Surge, maybe get these uh, two pieces of board, use Tunic, Starfall. The Starfall will be two go again, so we don't have to show that we have a Channel Lightning Valley right away. Uh, but this Waxing Spectre existing on the board is actually kind of bad news for us. We really would have liked more Assurance that the Surge was going to hit, or at least clear the way for Starfall, and now we don't even know if we're gonna clear the way for Starfall. Um, Enigma could just have pitched the Chi she got into another Spectral Shield. She probably wouldn't, that's terrible value, but she could have. Uh, or played Mirror Guy, and um, that would have soaked something up. The fact that she sank below from hand, a really good value from us, she had a one card two, but it still means this Starfall is not going to hit. And so now we're in a position where we don't know what our hand looks like after Arcanic Shockwave. So we have an option of how we want to pitch a Channel Lightning Valley. We either pitch it for Grasp or pitch it for Aurora, but pitching into Aurora means that we are expecting that our Channel Lightning Valley, one is Shockwave is going to hit and draws a card, 
and two is going to draw us an attack that we can actually use the go again for. We don't actually have an assurance that that's going to happen. It's very likely, given how we've constructed our deck, but we don't know. So do we take the guaranteed damage by pitching Channel Lightning into Grasp, then playing Arcanic Shockwave, and we just hope that we maybe rip uh, Sigil of Solace off the top of our deck? Or do we take the uh, lower value, riskier, but higher reward play of pitching into Aurora, making an embodiment, then playing Arcanic Shockwave so that we can play and attack off the top? I think we are supposed to pitch into Aurora. Uh, if I'm making this call now, I'm pitching Channel Lightning into Aurora. I am playing Arcanic Shockwave, fusing it with Channel Lightning, and then I'm playing the Channel Lightning. We know that the one from Shockwave won't hit because Aurora has a Spectral Shield, but we are then also presenting her with a question, which is, how are you going to block four damage from Shockwave? And at this point, yes, we are dealing more damage. This Rune Chant is going to destroy the Spectral Shield. Aurora now takes one point of Arcane from the Shockwave and then another five from the Physical. This Sizzle is unplayable. We can get no value from it, even if we had the ability to, but say it was a Snatch or an Entwine Lightning or a Ravenous Rabble, just something else. Say it was this Flittering Charge. Well, we got one point of value from making a Rune Chant, but then we lost four points of value from not being able to play Flittering Charge. So that is a situation where I would have taken the riskier play because of the higher reward, or at least because Enigma is afraid of our reward and wants to make sure that we don't draw from Channel Lightning Valley. Also, Enigma doesn't know that we have an Arc Lightning in hand, so us making Grasp, uh, pitching to Grasp and making a Rune Chant just tells her that we cannot play the other card in our hand. So in hindsight, it was the correct play because we could not play uh, our Arc Lightning or our Sizzle without losing a very powerful card in Arc Lightning, but we didn't trust our deck, and had we trusted our deck, at least in a future game, there's a very good chance that we get paid off. Uh, as far as how to play this hand, it's very interesting. Again, we don't want to block here, not because we are not concerned about this mirror guy. We are. We're taking 8, we're going to 20. Presumably Enigma has a follow-up. It's more that this hand doesn't block very well. Um, we have two 2 blocks, one of which is a critical piece of our deck, and the other synergizes really well with our hand. What's interesting about this hand and Arc Lightning is because of these two instants, Arc Lightning is actually very bad here. Uh, we play Arc Lightning, it deals a point of arcane from itself, the Sizzle in our Arsenal deals a point of Arcane, the Flittering deals a point of Arcane, and then that's it. Arc Lightning was three points of value, which is really bad. Uh, we want Arc Lightnings, especially on five cards, to be getting five or six points of value. So I'm probably not going to play the Arc Lightning this turn. I'm probably going to play the Sizzle, play the Flittering Charge, Somersault the Flittering Charge back, and again, we have a question. It depends on whether the Flittering Charge hits or not. We'll talk about that in a bit. We're not going to block this Mirror Guy, and we are not intending to play Arc Lightning on our turn. So we are just signing up to take a bunch of damage, which is unfortunate. We're thinking we probably can get this Mirror Guy off the board. Enigma only has four cards and no ward currently to protect the Mirror Guy. Uh, but we are taking a bunch of damage to make this happen. There's no reason to block this Enigma Chimera, but we are just kind of sad to be taking six. At least it isn't Command and Conquer. So our turn starts, we play Sizzle, we play Flittering Charge, with the intention of somersaulting it to not only give it go again, but give us another attack. Play the Sizzle, play the Flittering. Um, there are a number of ways that Enigma could stop this from hitting. Literally any 3-block and Mirror Guy soak up the 7. And then we have an interesting question, which is, 
do we take the higher immediate value of playing discharge to attack with flittering charge for seven, or do we take the slightly lower value riskier but higher reward line of pitching discharge to attack with starfall? Starfall is only two compared to discharge is three, but it does have go again. We've played lightning cards this turn. And if we draw, then it is possible that we get to push more damage this turn. Again, I take the lower value line and I don't believe that is correct. I think we are supposed to pitch into Starfall so that we are at least asking Enigma a question because here she can just not block. We don't want to give this go. Again, we could use snaps, but we're not gonna blind snap here. And unlike on our last turn, we draw an Entwine Lightning. So let's say that Starfall had hit, Enigma takes five less points of damage. She's at 30 currently. We get to play Entwine, fuse it with Flittering Charge to put her to 26, and then we play the Flittering Charge to put her to 22. So she is at less life now, and we don't take an Intellect Penalty. I'd like to arsenal this Entwine Lightning not only to protect it, but also so that I can fuse with it. Um, we have a Mirage Metamorph coming at us. Enigma taking an Intellect penalty. Um, trying to think of what she could have that she wouldn't want to pitch for this Metamorph. Um, Manifestation of Miragai being one, but I don't know. Something else... Presumably she could have pitched one of these two cards to use Metamorph rather than Spring Tunic. We are in a position where blocking this is difficult because we want to get value out of our Arc Lightning. But at the same time, uh, this hand is, again, weird. So we play our Arc Lightning, it gets in for one, we would probably want to play E-Strike to get in uh, for another one with go again, and we would draw a card, but what are we bottoming to the E-Strike? Sizzle is our worst card in hand. It's worth three compared to the four of Entwine and Snatch, but if we bottom our Sizzle and draw something that isn't Lightning, we can't give Entwine go again without using our Snapdragon Scalers. And if we play Arc Lightning, we attack with Snatch, Enigma blocks it, well now we're in a weird state where we play the Entwine Lightning, we fuse it with Sizzle, that gets uh, four with Go again, but but then what? We can't play the Sizzle because we only have an E-Strike in hand, so we could play the Sizzle, shoot Enigma for one, pitch E-Strike to attack with Starfall for five, shoot Enigma for one. We're pushing big damage, but we're also not really threatening any sort of on-hit. Um, it's interesting, we are just getting beat up here, and we aren't really drawing hands that work well together. So we're probably going to play Arc Lightning, we're running out of time, we need to try to make something happen, and Arc Lightning is that card to try and make something happen. So what is our optimal line? For one thing, we're not going to block, we need five cards because we need to try to do something. Um, so with these five cards, we open with Arc Lightning, assuming that Enigma does not block and doesn't use Arcane Barrier. What's the most damage we can deal? We play Arc Lightning, that is one. We play uh, Snatch, that is four plus one to a total of six. We play Entwine, fuse it with Sizzle, that's another five for 11. We play Sizzle, is 12, and then we pitch East, try to attack with Starfall, is 18. We get 18 points of damage overall. We are not threatening any on hits. We're still at seven and we're just kind of hoping that that's okay. Uh, the Snatch does threaten an on hit. The Snatch probably gets something from Enigma. If we use E-Strike draw and take a chance that we draw into a new lightning card, say we do, say we draw into a flittering charge or a lightning surge, we Arc Lightning for one, E-Strike for five plus one is seven. Entwine Fused is 12. Play, I don't know, Flittering Charge. 
for four and then snap it is 17, play snatch is 21, and we draw off the top. That is our best play. We are just taking a chance. Um, sadly, our tunic is not up, so we can't work a star fall into this turn without pitching a red. Uh, it just is an interesting game state, considering that we are not guaranteed to draw lightning off the top of our deck. Uh, if we knew we were going to draw lightning off the top of our deck, then this decision is really easy. Or if we had a second lightning card in hand, this is really easy, but it isn't. Um, the highest potential value line is with Snatch and Snatch hitting, but we're so far behind, we need to make something happen. Uh, we draw into Ravenous Rabble, which is good and bad. It kind of balances out. Because if this was a Flittering Charge or a Lightning Surge, the Entwine Lightning would have Go again, but that new Lightning card wouldn't, and instead Ravenous Rabble has Go again, but Entwine Lightning doesn't. Um, revealing an Arc Lightning is unfortunate. We miss a point of damage from the Rabble. But Enigma has not shown us that she wants to block anything, so pretty likely that she doesn't have a Sink Below or a Fate for Scene. If she did, surely she would have used it on the E-Strike just to get her value. So what I do like doing here is playing a little risky. We throw the Entwine Lightning, we can't fuse it, but let's snap it. Um, so that we can work a Snatch into this turn as well. Because if Enigma has to give us a real card and equipment to stop the snap from hitting, then we're pretty ahead. We're, we're now catching up very well. And if the Snatch hit, does hit, then we uh, have a five card arc lightning hand. And with four cards and no tunic, there's only so much that Enigma can do offensively. Um, we do have four points of armor to play with. So we're looking at a command and conquer. And we have a very interesting decision to make because we can cover this with six and keep a very good hand. We block with Crown of Providence, Grasp, and Static Shock. Our turn, we uh, play Flicker Wisp, fuse it, play Arc Lightning, gone in a flash, tune it to Starfall, and then snatch. And we're dealing a ton of damage. And it was at eight with AB1. So if we play out that entire turn, Flicker Wisp deals 2, Arc Lightning makes it 4, Gone in a Flash is 10, uh, Starfall is 14, and then Snatch is 18. We're presenting a 4 card 18, and it's split damage, Enigma can't just AB at all, she has to do some blocking, we're in a very good spot if that all happens. What we haven't seen from Enigma, but what I am concerned about, is Pummel, because on Enigma's last turn, she took an Intellect penalty. She kept two cards in hand, and specifically she used her Tunic to play Miraging Metamorph as opposed to just pitching one of her two remaining cards. So if we're talking about important cards that Enigma wouldn't have wanted to pitch, but also couldn't play, well, Pummel's at the top of my list, because you can't Pummel a Metamorph, but you can sit on a Pummel for when you find disruption like Command and Conquer. Can we afford to play around Pummel? And unfortunately the answer is no, because we are now kind of caught up to where Enigma is. Um, we put her from 25 down to 8. We have a 5 card hand. We have what is very likely to be lethal damage. But we need to get through this next turn. And unfortunately, with our attacks being Static Shock, Gone in a Flash, and Snatch, we're very reliant on this Arc Lightning to make our turn work. Say that we crown the Arc Lightning away and we draw a new card. Well, now our hand is Snatch, Flicker Wisp, Gone in a Flash, and something that we don't know. And we don't have a way to give any of that go again. So we're very dependent on like second strike or discharge or some lightning card that maybe has go again um, but if we don't draw that if we draw another snatch or another rabble or another flicker wisp or gone in a flash so many cards in our deck just don't let us present lethal damage and give enigma the opportunity 
to get her tempo back. So it puts us into this position where we have to assume that Enigma doesn't have pummel because if we play around the pummel, we can't win. And if we don't play around pummel and Enigma doesn't have pummel, then we do win. So we are making this decision to play to win rather than play to not lose and are choosing to just make Enigma have it. And so the block to make Enigma have it is crown, grasp, and static shock. And then we don't crown. We just keep our arc lightning in arsenal and hope that Enigma doesn't have a way to make this command and conquer connect. This is now a situation where it would actually be pretty cool if Grasp had two points of block on it because then we are sort of incidentally playing around um, grain that tips the scale, pumping this CNC up to seven. We could put Tunic in front of this if we were really nervous about that, but um, we also kind of need our Tunic to win because we need to throw a Starfall at our opponent. Uh, Enigma does not have the pummel in arsenal. She has something else. And so now we do get to play out this four card combo that is probably gonna kill Enigma. Uh, Flicker Wisp does kill the Restless Coalition. Arc Lightning is going to present two Arcane, which Enigma chooses to take. Gone in a Flash will attack for four, uh, plus two Arcane from its go again. I do like leading with Gone in a Flash rather than Snatch. Um, Enigma is already incentivized to block because if she doesn't, she dies. And um, if we can just end with a snatch and it doesn't kill Enigma, then hey, we're in a pretty good position because we drew a card and we get to send five more cards. Um, Enigma realizing that um, your life total dropping to zero um, does create a state of being dead uh, and is fast enough to hit that undo. So. The game continues. We did see two blues and two waxing specters in Enigma's hand. Um, which means that she is probably just dead. But we will see if maybe she can find a way out of this. We don't know what the card in Arsenal is, though at this point we're assuming it is not a defense reaction. Because Sync or Fate for four would have been a really good way to cover Gone in a Flash. No blocks on the Starfall. Uh, we are going to see a blue pitch for the Waxing Spectre, which covers the Starfall, and then the Floating Resource covers one point of the Arcane. We do know that Enigma is holding a second Waxing Spectre, which can't block this Snatch. So if this card in Arsenal is not a D-React, then that is going to put the game away, and that is in fact what happened. Uh, sitting on a Manifestation of Mirror Guy, um, rather than a Pummel. So really interesting game we did see several opportunities where we could have taken less upfront value for potential more back-end value we also saw that of the uh, three instances where that happened two of them it actually was incorrect the third one was a little iffy that the arc lightning into e-strike was it, it worked out the same way um, there were very few draws we could have had where we would have actually gotten more value than what we got. Um, but at least earlier in the game, the decision to pitch the Channel Lightning Valley into Grasp of the Arc Knight rather than Aurora did end up being more value. Um, we would not have been able to use that sizzle very well had we drawn it. We would have missed one point of damage, but the second time... We chose to play safe rather than play a little riskier we actually did lose out on three damage so i think for aurora based on how she's built and how many attacks are in the deck we are supposed to as a general rule of thumb take those high risk high reward lines where we give up a point for a potential three or four points on the back end but you can still not get paid off by making the right call just based on the fact that we draw so many random cards off the top of our deck. Um, what I did not catch, re-watching this game for the first time, was that turn two play of Discharge into Flittering Strike rather than, uh, Discharge into Flittering Charge rather than Flittering Charge into Lightning Press. 
and that discharge actually would have been a much better line. We would have gotten more damage out of that and out of snapping that gone in a flash than we did get from snapping the entwine lightning because we could have just uh, pitched entwine to starfall. So I hope you enjoyed this game. I hope you learned something. If so, be sure to zap that like button. My comments are always open for any questions or feedback. Uh, if you have not already done so, please consider a YouTube subscription. It's the best free way to support me. I have a Discord and a Twitter, which are free to join or follow. I have a Patreon, which uh, for small monthly fees will get you the sideboard to this deck. We'll get you bonus videos every week. Uh, and all that information is in the video description below. Until the next time I see you on Daily Fab Gameplay, take care.